Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or good day wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the next episode of No Dice, No Glory. Sponsored by our jobs that actually pay us money, we're coming to you not at all live from an abandoned arms factory deep under a mountain in West Virginia. We are proud to proffer to you the finest in wargaming coverage. Without any further ado, let's get this show on the road. You know, my old podcasting buddy, Sean, probably wishes he was here right now. Because we are going to do something that I've only done once before in my life with him, which is play an RPG. And he kicked me out of his game. I think it was D&D because I wanted to name my character Thug Nuts Killer. Um, Perfect. But name. It, I think it is. So I'm joined with today, Nate and Mike. Say hi, guys. Hey, this is Nate. Pleasure to be this on the show. Mike. And um, so how this came about, if you listen to the podcast where we sat down and talked with the designer of the game, Gabe, uh, I brought to him and Al and the, uh, the rest of the guys from Firelock that, hey, I'm going to get some real soldiers to play this game and see what they think. So I just didn't pull soldiers off the street. You know, I could do that with my legs. Um, but I, I, I work with both Nate and Mike. Um, but the big reason why they're with me today is because I, I'm not an RPG guy, and I kind of wanted these two dudes that play a lot of RPGs to kind of be with me. If you guys could briefly, like, tell us how long you've been playing RPGs and what games have you played in the past. Go ahead, Nate. Uh, so I've been playing these things for about... 29 years now. Uh, my, my villain origin story with this is that I had a, a buddy of ours in school, had a, a kooky aunt who got him a Dungeons and Dragons box starter set for his birthday out of the blue. And knew, knowing nothing about the game, we all opened it up and just went bonkers. We loved it. And this was like our little middle school obsession uh, until one of our friends, uh, their parents weren't sure what we were doing. So they went to talk to their priest about our new hobby. And of course, the priest said, like, oh, that's the game where kids go in the sewers and kill each other with lead pipes. And so a horrified parent shut the whole thing down. And we were despondent for about a year until one of us got the bright idea to, to ask, hey, could we play this vampire role playing game instead? Which anybody who knows the difference of the game, like vampire is a way more mature game. The middle schoolers <laughs> should probably not play. But the priest had never heard of vampire. So we got to play that. And then it's kind of off to the races. Uh, <laughs> since then, been playing a whole host of stuff, including some of the games that inspired the base mechanics for War Stories, the Year Zero engine. So really excited to give this thing a test spin. Yeah. Mike, what about you? Uh, so about the same time, late 80s, early 90s, middle school through high school, um, a lot, a lot, a ridiculous amount in college. And then a little bit shortly after coming in the army and a lot more once COVID hit. Um, systems, there was a lot of D and D, there was a lot of D20 based systems, a lot of D10 based systems in college. Uh, there were three or four homebrew systems and then a couple of just storytelling systems, no dice involved at all. Were you about to say no There's dice, no glory? glory? I almost did, yes. All right. I you know, we are. We we have we have to give you a dollar if you do that. But it was uh, you know different systems, interesting things. Um, yeah, so I'd be curious to see how this one goes. Yeah, me too, me too. So for those of you who don't, first of all, if you met these two guys on the street, you would not think that they were avid, addicted gamers, and, and they both are. And I'm sorry, I diagnosed both of you guys. Uh, they hold down day jobs. Um, Nate does live in a basement as we speak, this but, is true. but, uh, he's what we call uh, geo batching it. So essentially these two RPG and army guys will take the uh, retired airman through his first historical RPG war stories. Um, by the time this comes out should be shipping to your houses. Uh, I hope I know I'm getting a set and I'm going to try to get a set for you guys too. Um, I'm excited, like, and I'll give you a little history here. I bought Twilight 2000 because everybody else was, 
um, it's still in the box. And you can see me pointing to it now. Uh, I, I really want to kind of see what the trick is with RPG. I would going in with you guys. I I think I'm in good hands. I don't know. So I am going to ask a lot of questions. Um, we will have a follow on podcast in a couple of weeks after this, where we get some other dudes and maybe a dude that don't know and play the game. And I think in this podcast, you're going to kind of learn how to start, generate your character, and and you're going to hear a lot about war stories just on this podcast. So Nate loves to be the DM. Now, if you listen to the original podcast, I said that the DM, which is the game master, dungeon master, should be called the Supreme Allied Commander. Obviously, they did not go with that for good for good reason. So it's Nate, a suggestion though. It is a great suggestion, but like most of my suggestions, um, it's uh, fantastic. So, <laughs> Nate, you're going to take it away. Take us through this, my friend. Sure thing. Uh, so first, because I have you as a temporary hostage, I'm going to take you all down a little trip for the history of making characters in role-playing games. So the, the oldest way, the original way, you know, way back in ancient times, was you just rolled random dice, and wherever the dice fell, that was your character. So you might end up randomly with a wizard or a thief or a fighter, and you just had no idea to sat down and roll the dice. And that I was love, kind of all there was. You were a, Can I be a wizard in this game? Uh, you can certainly try. Uh, you're always welcome to try. How the well that serves you on the June 6, 1944 remains to be seen. Uh, but the, the thing with that was that you were basically just numbers on the sheet as a character. And... In the original game, we just go about, you know, running through hallways, stabbing orcs. That was probably all you needed. Uh, the new sensibility, like the more modern way of making characters, tends to focus on making a backstory, coming up with this idea of like, oh, I really want to play this kind of character from, from TV or a novel or a movie or just have this, this thing I want to express with myself. And it's very uh, narrative and exposition focused in terms of building your character that way. And then you just sort of bolt the stats on afterwards. Uh, what I like about War Stories, what they went with, is they actually have called back a slightly more old school way to square the circle between these two philosophies. And that's called the life path system, where you roll a bunch of random dice on tables to generate your character. But in the process, you also end up fleshing them out with some history, personality, a little hint of randomness so you can quickly make somebody and have them seem like an actual person in the story, but without taking a lot of time, which is useful because uh, if you get a chance to preview the, the game itself, it turns out that you can actually go through characters pretty quickly in World War II. It was a very bloody conflict. It was indeed. Uh, so with that, on the, if you have the PDF available, uh, on page 18 of the PDF, it has the, the steps laid out for the life path, and we're going to start off with that there. Uh, so uh, if you have that available. Oh, I'm getting to it. And I'll tell you what, we're going to have Mike. When you're not talking, silence your mic. You're getting some background noise. Oh, yep, we'll do. I mean, you know, we love to hear from you. So page 18, I'm getting there. I, you know, I love this book, man. This book is so cool. Like, I, I, don't, I don't read fluff. Um, a lot of it's because I've written a lot of fluff for 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 different games. Uh, the fluff here is pretty cool. So I'm on page 18. It's just a big ass picture. So I'm ready. So, the, uh, yeah, so with the, the life path system here, the, uh, the first thing that we do is establish the group concept. And so since we're going in this for the, the one shot demo, the going with the core of the game, the group concept for everyone, you know, so the two of you and then everybody else who joins, uh, is that you're all members of the same squad within uh, the 1st Battalion of the 501st uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment uh, in D-Day. So specifically, your 2nd Squad, 1st Platoon, Baker Company. And if you, it, you need me to repeat that, I'll happily do it ad nauseum. But the, no, the concept it says, is... It yeah. says that in here? No, no, no. This is the... So the, the step is... You have a group concept, so everyone oh. says, "You know, we're all, you know, we're all disaffected French pastry chefs who decided to go blow up a Nazi train, or you know, we're all, uh, we're all coming ashore at Anzio, 
But the, the idea is that you, the first step is everyone is on the same page. You don't end up with the Patriot, you know, the pastry chef, the paratrooper, and the engineer and Anzio all in the same group because as is you might guess, that, that operation doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Is there a reason why you picked the 504th? Uh, so the 501st, we picked uh, for the one shot. Uh, first of all, because it is not the one shot in the book. So that way people are getting something that's not going to necessarily spoil the adventure that comes with the book itself. Uh, it's also not an adventure in the campaign book uh, that Firelock is also publishing. So this is a way that to make sure that you were not spoiling anything for po folks who want to spend uh, cash money on this product later. But also because these folks ended up uh, on the morning of June 6th with this incredibly crazy mission that started off horrifically wrong and then somehow carried the day. So they, so assuming that your roles uh, get you through it, you should have a, a nice arc from start to finish. I like that. I like that. And then any game master can do that. Yeah. So, the, so one of the things that's great about the, this particular concept is when I was looking at what do I, what do, I do for a one shot, all I had to do was just hit Wikipedia real quick and find a unit that I hadn't really heard. It wasn't like something like, oh, yeah, it's not, you know, the Band of Brothers. It's something else, you know, adjacent to pick something. Find, like, hey, what's, the, what's the Battle of La Barquette Lock? Never heard of it. Let me do a Google. Pull up the official Army military history, U.S. Army military history. Has the battle, has the maps, has the commander interview. It's like, oh, well, you know what? I think that's going to be in my next session. And you could do that with pretty much any battle in World War II or just make something up wholesale if you want to. But there's so much material out there outside of you know, what's, what's been beat to death in Hollywood that it's pretty easy to come up with a scenario uh, with maybe, you know, a couple hours of prep. I, I did no such preparation, just, just putting it out there on easy street. So, you know, the, that would not be the first time a player has said that to a game master. So we're in good hands. All right, I'm ready. All right, all so right. The, so we've got the group concept. So you're all in the same squad in the first of the 501st. Uh, step two of the life path is to, to determine your nationality. So obviously, if you're in the, in the if you're in the 101st, you are all American soldiers. Uh, but uh, you do have the option of being a natural born American or rolling on the random table. And so throw it to, to both you and to Mike whether you want to see if you're. Uh, if you're born in the USA or, uh, or, or coming by other means? Well, I like to roll because I will be in that character's voice. Oh, perfect. All right, well, let's, yeah. let's roll. Then we're going to roll a 10-sided die here. So we're going to hit up a D10. All right, what page are we on? Uh, so on my PDF, I am on page 19. But if you said you see a picture, then that we're going off of different versions. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I sent you the same one. Uh, okay. I'm there. Okay. Yeah. But we'll figure it out. So, uh, what do I roll? Uh, so you're rolling a D10. All right. Go ahead. Roll it for me, sir. All right. We are rolling a D10 and getting a nine, which according to the random nationality table, and I already hate that, uh, that I'm saying this, uh, you are Irish. Ah, ha, ha. Of course I am. Of course, of course. So <laughs> my my character's name would be Evan Gobralis. Okay, I'm Irish. You, Mike, you are Irish. what are you what are you gonna do? Well, I rolled over here and I got Canadian. Oh. Yeah. Both are both I are good. About. Ah. When do All I pick right. my name? Can I pick my name now? Uh you can you can pick it now or at the end, but it is it's I'm going to wait till the, the end. final steps. doesn't matter. Okay. So I have it nationally Irish. What's next? All right. So next, uh, we roll to determine your upbringing. So the upbringing is going to give you some of your initial base skills uh, and then the, the potentially also give you a talent, an interesting bonus that makes your character a little different from the others. Now, this will also identify what your key attribute is. So there's four attributes in war stories. Uh, there's strength agility, intelligence, and empathy. And so you, you have to divide 15 points among these four attributes, but you can only start with a five in your key attribute. And obviously those attributes then affect, uh, they all have associated skills with them and will determine kind of like how good you are at certain things in the game. 
So crazy question here on this one. Um, I'm Irish. We all know the story of the Irish in, uh, you know, United States. I, I'm not going to come out as a fluent or intellectual unless my last name's Kennedy. So uh, roll her away, I guess. All right. So, so for this, we're rolling a uh, six side dice D6 to determine what your upbringing was uh, as uh, Mitch the Irishman. Yeah. And we ended up with a rolling a one, which gives you the street kid upbringing. So you were a kid uh, growing up in the big city, uh, you know, blue collar, destitute, possibly an orphan, but you are a creature of the alleys and side streets, you know, sneaking into shops and, and uh, you know, scalping tickets to the cinema. You know, I, th I, I think you just committed a microaggression, but okay. Um, <laughs> and, and then I know that we go to another table and it gives me my life story. It does actually. So again, the, the thing about the life path system is it's designed so that if you, if you walk in there, you just you know, walk up the table and say, Hey, I want to play this game. That the idea is with a, with a dozen dice rolls, you walk away with a character, not just the yep. stats, but like, Hey, here's your, you know, and there's, there's obviously the story is broad enough that you can shape it as you want to, as you go, assuming your character survives long enough that you want to fill that in those gaps but yeah like this is the next role here as you see this what happened as you were growing up will well, let's determine let, what let's your let skills mike are. do his upbringing yeah mike what you got all right let's see that is a rural small town well you're from you're from saskatoon all righty uh, so, yeah. the, the, uh, so the next thing then for this the specific upbringing table, we roll a six side dice again to, like you said, to figure out what your life story looks like at the beginning. And we rolled another one. Uh, uh, I'll read this. I lived my um, life on the streets, thieving and scavenging to survive. I was caught many times by the local police chief, Chief O'Hara, and he took me under his wing. And it gave you away off the streets. And according to this, my, my skill distribution is close combat, guts, infiltrate, nimble, which if you see me in real life, I am, ranged combat and survival. My key attribute looks like it's agility. And Chief O'Hara gave me a 38 caliber revolver. Indeed nice. he did. He did. All right. Let's see what the small town boy does. Oh. He's going to be some type of shepherd or, or farmer. Your local town is known for one industry and one industry alone, and the family has depended upon it. Life was hard, always just a hair's breadth away from unemployment in the bread line. In the bread line. No wonder you turn to thievery to get by. Stamina, nimble, infiltrate, survival, guts and perception, agility. Old habits die hard, and you never want to pass up a chance to enrich yourself. A theme developing already in the squad. That's what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. So, no, hey, hey, hey. I didn't steal it. I just reacquired it. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but one thing we should kind of mention that um, it doesn't have your role in this game. They were all white guys. So, the, there is a, a discussion in the front of the book, the matter before this where it, it says if you want to take things ahistorical, you are more than welcome to. And so for the, for the purpose of the demo, I am agnostic on what people want to play and how they want to present. Uh, obviously, if you're going full historical, then yes, this would obviously be a unit of, of all white dudes. But the, they do make an explicit shout out to uh, the Firelock folks in the sidebar up front that you are not bound to that by any means when you play the game. And, and look, with this game system, it's not just limited to Normandy. Obviously, the, the initial book is about that. But you could play the 92nd Infantry Division in Italy. Um, you could play the, uh, six, the 761st Tank Destroyers. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of other means. We yeah, are you, just You can play French it. Partisans. You could play, you know, OSS, SAS uh, Infiltrators working with French Partisans. Uh, you could play Polish Resistance Fighters. Like, it's a... It's a flexible enough system that with you know a little bit of tinkering, you can 
tell pretty much any story from the Allies in this time period. All right. So next we go to languages. Well, first, uh, uh, yeah. we, we do have to make sure that we, so we split up those three skill points among those skills. And you can only, you can put no more than two points in a single skill. So you can't now, we need, specialize off the, from the start. Do we need to distribute that now? Or can we wait until we get down to like the virtues and the class and all of that? You want to distribute them now because you see that they, you might end up with a natural spread that gets you out across the, the rest of your character. You, you do want to try to avoid the, like the guy who's the one trick pony of like, oh man, Bill just made this crazy sniper dude. Uh, he can't talk, and he you know he falls over when he puts on his rucksack, but he can snipe. So that the life path system is designed in part to avoid kind of gaming the system that way. Right. So mine, mine are close combat, range combat, and infiltrate. So you're taking one in each, then. Yes, sir. All right, sounds good. Let's go with nimble and perception. Um, two in nimble, one in perception. Easy enough. Uh, so then, the neither of your backgrounds gave you languages, but there is a section here uh, if your character was bilingual. Uh, but the next step is to determine uh, what you did in your pre-wartime adult life. And so your pre-war experience. Another table here. We are rolling a six-sided dice a again. Uh, to see what you were doing as an adult before the war kicked off. So a, as, oh, as you're creating this character, like let's say you roll on this table and I get academic. That, no. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Can I just pick one? You can just pick one. So the, the table is, is there to inspire creativity and to get people moving so they're not just stuck there wondering, you know, how did my character end up with this tragic backstory? If, you, if you, something jumps out at you, then there's nothing stopping you from going with that. All right. With, so with, you know, go ahead. So I think with your background, if you want to say, hey, based on my relationship with Chief O'Hara, I want to pick, go straight into law enforcement by all means. Well, look, I mean, the 30s were hard. So maybe I joined the regular army before, before the war or something like that. Um, so let me see. Because each one of these selections, has more attributes that are going down. So I'm, I'm going to go with your recommendation. I'm going to go with law enforcement. And then I'll let uh, Mike pick. All right. All right, I'll roll. We'll see what comes of it. Three for working class. Warehouse, right. factories, doing whatever work you could get. Milking the cow. All right. Until I ran away. Hey, All no right. shame in that. Uh, so then, Mitch, you see that we now have the, the, we can go down to the law enforcement life experience where there's yeah. a couple more things. There's a, a role to see which branch of law enforcement you're in or to, to pick. And then there's, so, a, then there's the random event to see what happened to you in that time period. I, I think based on my backstory, because I'm starting to get into this, I'm going to go with local police, which means I have persuasion. So that makes sense. So that means you, so you automatically get that plus one in persuasion. So you just yeah. add, for you, I think that that adds the skill. Yeah, it was awesome. All right, Mike, you're going to pick or you're going to roll the die? Or give me one second. Oh, you know what? I see. I think I was rolling off the wrong table. Military, law enforcement, labor force, professional. Yeah, I was looking at the complete wrong list. Yeah. I'm on that that just a learning experience. Page 37 of the PDF on the lower left hand. Yep. Yeah, the pre-war experience. I was looking at working class. Um, is there no... Oh, there is. All right, so six was other... No, I had three, didn't I? Three was three lawful, three labor uh, force. Labor yeah. force. Uh, all right, so we'll roll off labor force. All right. Well, I have... Uh, Issues with authority. <clears throat> sounds Any like it, it sounds like you're perfect for the airborne. <laughs> <laughs> and neither of you were in an airborne the 82nd in your careers. That, right? That's correct. Yeah. Nope. 
Yeah. All right. I can, but now I can pretend to be one through role playing. Yeah. So law enforcement, roll me a D6 there, brother. All right. So to find out the event that happened in this time period, we hit a five. So That's if you want to read from the table. You face down a desperate criminal and risk your life to save some innocent people. Wait, that's that's the Beatles. I'm sorry. He was threatening. You killed him with a fine shot to save today. So infiltrate and range combat. So oh, on top of those, so there's there's the list of skills at the top of the chart. So you, you get some and range combat infiltrate. So you get to pick from that list of total list of skills to distribute two points among. So I'm already range combat one and infil and uh, infiltrate one. So I am just going to put a two, one on each. And that's me. All right. And this is, uh, what, you, what did you say the point distribution on this one was, Nate? Uh, so you get two points to split among that list. Okay. And as long as your skill doesn't go above two, you're good. Let's go with persuasion and insight. Okay. All right. What did you roll for your event, Mike? Uh, for the event, it was six. Take issue with the foreman over safety, end up with a raging argument, but instead of getting fired, the bosses fire the foreman and give me his job. Nice. You do have a problem. So it here says bonus, right? If, yep. you, ta if you take another pre-war experience roll on this table, add plus one to the result. That's optional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, the, so there is an option, the character generation on the life path system, where you can roll on the life experience again, and it basically adds 10 years to your character's life. So you say no. that, hey, I'm, I'm, nah. going to, I'm going to be older. The trade-off is every time you do that, you subtract a point from one of your attributes. I'm not you, you, I'm so you could be the 50-year-old the private and be super skilled and experienced, but then you would end up taking, I think, a minus four to your, all your stats. Or to not all your stats, but to your overall. Yeah. No, I'm good. All, all right. right. And that's that's a harken back to this is a that's a nice shout out to the of the old traveler role playing game that started yep. life path system where you could actually die during character creation creation if you yep. really. I I've seen conversations with people that have yeah. So it's, it's a All good right. meme. I, I appreciate they slipped that in there. Uh, so the next table then is uh, the war years. And this is specifically uh, what you have been doing since the war broke out. All right. Um, so once again, and that's the beauty, I think, of an RPG, especially this kind of character creation, because when I created Thug Nuts Quick Killer, the Thief Dwarf, um, you didn't really have these options. You were kind of really stuck. But like in this one, you could roll or you could choose, but that's going to be really up to whoever your game master is, I would suppose. Right. Um, so I'm looking at the war years here, and I, I'm going to go with the military service. Makes sense. Yeah. And then, um, Mike, uh, what are you going to do? I think I, um, I can see you rolling a three. Random. All right. Let's see what you got. You going to roll another three for criminal? I think, I think, yeah. Is that what you got? Sure. Yeah. Mike's a criminal. Sounds about right. Not judging. <laughs> not, not judge. judge. <laughs> not judging. With, All right. with leadership. So now we go down to the, my military service table. And um, once again, you, what I dig about this is you, you have so many options, right? Um, oh, absolutely. But I'm going to let you roll because I'm hoping for a six here. Because if I just say six, it, 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 which is I'm already in the airborne. Obviously, the airborne. So, um, but odds are one through four infantry, five armored. But each one of these selections or, or random die rolls generates kind of your more about your character. So, Nate, give me a give me a roll. All right. So let's hit you up, and you end up with a six, a one. Uh -huh. So you have infantry. Uh, uh, so uh, must finish training with a ranged combat skill of at least one. I'm good. Indeed. Yeah. And then and so, we go, get. Yeah. And then, uh, then you see there down there, there's the, your specific branch within the service. 
And so four there, uh, rolling a a D6, and then it's gonna we're gonna select from the infantry airborne table uh, because you can do that. Or there's also if you're a member of an armored uh, vehicle crew, a separate little bar there for what the ah. jobs are. All right, hit me up. We I don't want to be an engineer. Those guys are jacked. All right, we end up with uh, four combat medic. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't really fit my character, but I'll tell you what. I'm going to play this U0 out, so I am a prior combat medic. All right, so your key skill there is medical aid. And you now have uh, four points to split up uh, among the skill, uh, remaining skills of your choice. So the, of all the 16 skills in the game, you have four points to allocate, uh, and then choosing one relevant specialization. Okay. Do I have to do that now? Uh, you don't necessarily. I mean, you don't have to do that now. This is like the. This is the part where you would do that in the life path. Uh, okay. I, I, so I'm going to play it by the rules here. Where are the 16 skills again? What page is that? Now? Oh, here I go. Yeah. yeah. So that's. Uh, so if you look, and this is where the the sheet they have is actually nice. It's really. Uh, yeah. Well laid out with the, the what your four attributes are, and then the four skills that fall underneath all of them. So you'll see that they, you know, for strength you have the calisthenics, close combat, heavy weapons, and stamina, and then so on down with agility, intelligence, and empathy. And that gives you a chance to fill in what those numbers are. So I have some some decisions to make. I'm a two in range combat. Uh, I am a two in. I already forgot. I have a one in perception. Um, let me see. The, so, the two was an infiltrate. Uh, was nimble. Uh, infiltrate is two. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I am gonna tell. I'm gonna. So it looks like the bottom table wounds, weariness, and fear. We're not gonna do because that's not part of the sixteen. So yeah, I'm so gonna. All, all that stuff is that's. That's going to be for the actual gameplay uh, later on. Right. What All page right. is their uh, character sheet on? Uh, should be in the very back of the book. Yeah, the one I am on and looking at is uh, page 48 of the PDF. And if those of you are following at home, um, if you have the book, hopefully you'll be able to follow along. But I'm going to go with empathy, put one in medical aid. Um, I'm going to put one in calisthenics. I already have a one in perception. Um, I'm going to do stamina. And um, insight. Hopefully I can remember this as I'm typing this stuff out. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, and I then, guess uh, I didn't get my whole print out of the book because I'm not seeing it. So I can send you another copy. No, I'm just, it's not that you didn't get it. It's just when I printed it out, I didn't get the whole thing. That's why you showed up at work early the other day. <laughs> so right, then so. The other thing you do in this this step is you pick uh, your your one specialization you get. Sometimes based down background or experience, you can end up with other specializations. But you get a specialization, and there's actually a section in the skills chapter on specialization. It's a, essentially a, a unique attribute that gives you a bonus in a skill during certain situations. So for example, if you have the runner specialization, you get a plus one for calisthenics, uh, stamina, and nimble tests that involve running and your movement speed is increased, and, and you gain the bonuses when you succeed on a, on a roll to sprint. And so there's, and there's the, the specializations can have multiple tiers. You know, so for example, if there's a Silent Assassin 1 for close combat and a Silent Assassin 2, obviously you have to have the first tier before you can get the second tier. But it's basically something like your character is, is really good at this one thing under these certain conditions that can give you a bonus during play. Uh, you don't have to pick it now, but if you if you if you want to peruse through and see what makes sense, as long as you have the base skill for the specialization, you can choose it at this time. 
Okay, and I can find that. Yep, I, I'm there. So, Mike, you pick your four. All right. Well, let me get my roll on what type of criminal I am here. That is a big fat one. So I was just a prisoner, former prisoner. Whew. So looking at the key skills and specialization, if I decide to be a rifleman, I roll a die and I pick all those up. Um, in addition to the ones I already picked. Or is this table here on page 49 of the PDF in the book? Uh, well, we'll get to that. No, this is background characters. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah, what did you? Thing. I'm skipping. Go ahead. Tell me what I need to do next. No. So if you're so in the in the skills chapter, uh, which is chapter uh, four, so specializations and talents. Sorry. It's, uh, there's a a list there for each skill on uh, well, what the various specializations are there. And so, for example, for ranged combat. Uh, there, your rage combat is an agility skill, and the specializations there are uh, sharpshooter, pistol, uh, submachine gunner, or sniper. Uh, for example. yeah, and that is something about the book which I, I'm excited to get my hands on the physical copy. Is that it's so deep, like everything that we're talking about, these terms, they're all explained and they all link into one another. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Go ahead. You take me through, sir. Sorry. Uh, and so there, the, again, at the you know, for this uh, again, there's there's no restriction in here. As long as you have the skill for it, if you have the talent, you can buy the or the buy the specialization here. Uh, talents are a separate thing, but we'll unless it popped up in your background, you don't need to worry about it this time. So would it behoove me to go with something I have? A two in or a one or so as long as at least one in the skill you can pick it up uh the, so war stories like all the year zero games uses a dice pool system so it's your so when you roll for something it's going to be your attribute plus your skill plus any relevant specialization or talent and that's your dice pool of d6s and you're trying to roll at least one six out of that pool to succeed at a task Okay. There's a lot to read through here. Um, but um, huh. so if I, if I understood everything correctly, then Nate, um, the specialization that I'm looking at would be based on the primary, um, my key attribute, which I was given earlier. Is that correct? So the key attribute is the one that, uh, that you can raise. So the key attribute is the one that you can raise to five out of your four. For specializations, as long as you have the, the skill, you can also purchase your one free specialization with character creation. So you get right, a full one as part I, of your... I was looking at them the other way. No, I got it now. Okay, thanks. Yep. I don't want to be a medic. You can, not, you can choose to be a to not a medic. It's, it's roll or pick. If you'd rather be a engineer or rifleman, like, this is the chance to do it. There's, no, there's, it's, there's not a gun to your head. All right, well, let's see what the roll comes out to. Well, so the uh, for this, I look back, the, so the, the last roll on the table is from the, the war year. So there's no more randomization oh. from this point. Okay, so I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pick something fun. Go um, for it. I am going to go with... Um, so much to pick from here. Um, I'm going to go with break in. Now uh, it has to be break in one. Uh, I I assume because uh, if you if you purchase if, if so if through some circumstance you end up with two specializations at character creation, which you can get through some random rolls or backgrounds, or if your character survives long enough to earn experience points, you can, can use them, you could bump it up to two. Yeah. All right, all right, I get that. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do um, break in one. And uh, I'm writing all this down. 
Now, talents, do we do, uh, it looks like you have to pay XP for it, so that means I don't get to pick this. So talents, unlike the specializations, talents don't come automatically for free through the character generation. They only pop up if you end up with uh, certain results on the random table. And there's like 30 of them. Yeah, and so those are just, those are, are further ways to, uh, you know, for the, to define and distinguish your character from the other ones. So, where are we now as far as setting up the characters? Um, so there's, we have there's, there's now just a really a, a few admin things. Mm -hmm. uh, the first paperwork. is to determine your. There's always paperwork. There's always paperwork, mm -hmm. uh, but you're you're now on the downhill slope. Um, All right. So you pick a, if you, first. You fill in your endurance, which is the average of your strength and your empathy. Uh, plus one is the base rules for the game. You for the, for a grittier game style, you can not have the plus one, or for a more heroic Hollywood fantasy, you can add a plus two. But the baseline for the game is uh, an average of your strength and empathy plus one. Okay, so I have my empathy. I I have medical aid one. No, do I? Hold on. Let me look. Let me look. Your empathy, nope. so your empathy should be somewhere between uh, two and five for most characters. Well, usually it's a three or a four. Because that's your, your four attributes, uh, strength, agility, intelligence, and empathy. That's where you divide mm -hmm. your 15 points from. That's kind of the, the baseline of your character. Oh, so this is the 15 points now. Yeah, that's the 15 points. Okay, so now we get 15 more points to add to all these, right? No, so it's, the, so it's 15 points to split among those four. And so that adds up to, that averages out to 3.75 points per attribute if you try to, try to divide them evenly. The game doesn't do, uh, doesn't allow you to do decimals. So you end up with a, a three to four in most stuff. Your key attribute, the one that came from your, uh, your initial background, that uh, you can raise to five if you choose. So for you, your, your attributes are going to be somewhere between three to four with agility as your key attribute, uh, potentially being up to five. All right. So I am going to do, uh, hold on, I'm going to uh, agility four. So I'm down to 11. So I could do two fours. No. Okay. Um, so if I do... I, I lost the math. I could do three in everything, but I could pick one five and one four. But that yep. makes no sense. Yeah. So I'm gonna I, I'm gonna go agility five. Okay. And then I'm gonna do um intelligence four. And then three in the other two. So with with so three in strength and empathy, uh, your endurance is then going to be four, which is more or less average. I have uh, three in strength, five in agility, two in intelligence, and four in empathy. So we would be a great dancing with the stars couple. There you go. Yeah. At I least like it'll, be good, it'll be good shots. Uh, so hopefully you can get a beat on somebody. Yeah. And what I'm going to do between now and this is I'm going to actually take the character sheet. I'm going to throw all this in there. I'm going to send it to you to make sure I, I did this right. But I got to be honest. I thought it was going to be a little harder than this because the book has so much in it. But I guess somebody's been reading the book. Uh, again, the, the nice thing is that if you, and this is where it's really great as a transition point to, to get people from role playing, from uh, wargaming into role playing or someone who hasn't done any role playing at all into this is if you just sit them down and let them roll on the table, it, the, the characters tend to come together and gel a bit on their own naturally. Yeah. And, and, you know, our usual listeners are, are war gamers, uh, a lot of miniatures players. And I'm starting to see how this, if, especially if you like World War II history, this like takes it much deeper. So I'm going to ask you guys. I know we're not finished. Um, no, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on this question. I'm going to wait because Nate, take us through this experience. So, uh, so like so we're in the downhill slope. Uh, so, that's what she said. Indeed. Uh, so the next thing we do is pick a, a virtue and a flaw uh, from the virtue and flaw table. 
Um, my PDF isn't numbered the same as yours, unfortunately, uh, but there is a table, at least in my version, before the beginning of the main character sequence that has all the virtues on one side, all the flaws on the other. Yeah, and I yet, saw it. Yeah, mm. and so you, you, pick, you pick one from each column, and then some backgrounds give you additional ones. But the only hard and fast rule here is you can't pick a flaw and a virtue that cancel each other out. So you can't be cowardly and brave, for example, because that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but oh. otherwise, the, the flaw will give you a penalty in certain situations that where you're at disadvantage, and the virtue likewise gives you a bonus. So we roll, and whatever's on that line. Uh, you can do the random roll is totally fine, uh, or you can pick. I'll tell you what, let's go random roll. I like how they have polyglot here, and most people have to look that up. And a polyglot is a, is a parrot that's been run over by a truck. But, Clearly. Yes. So go ahead, it, and it's... Uh, now, this uses two D6s, but you use one to get a number between 11 and 66. So what do I have? So uh, you end up with a 42. Light sleeper, irritating, and helpful. That's me. Yep. So that was, I mean, we could roll three times each, but uh, but that would I think we've, that that does sum you up uh, pretty accurately, though, Mitch. So I think we can we can call that one of uh, put that in the books. Oh yeah, most of the dudes I work with hate me, but like you know, they're knobs. So it's uh, helpful. Like I try to be helpful, you know, just to watch in that naval... irritating sort of way. Yeah. Like this guy was trying to get a, a um, picture on one of our game posters today. And uh, it's just funny. I'm like, get out of my way, idiot. So anyway, I'm good. Mike, what are you doing? All right. Let's take this roll and see what happens. Somewhere in the fives. 53. How does this pair? Second win, unforgiving and bold for my criminal. What? What what was your second one? Oh, so uh, I was in a five, so it was a total of fifty three, or uh, five and three. So second wind, unforgiving and bold. Unforgiving. So you and I are definitely fighting on that old uh, drop zone. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. There you go. Got it. Yeah. Uh, the so the next step in the creation is actually to pick which player character is your buddy. So within the squad, everyone gets to pick a buddy. Now, of course, you want to have a, a weird friendship triangle. You could have, you know, you know my best friend uh, isn't, uh, I'm not my best friend's best friend sort of situation. But essentially, your, your buddy is someone that within the game, under certain situations, you can get bonuses to well, cooperate with your buddy. Mike and I were at Tacoa together, and um, we were always in trouble. And... We used to head downtown a lot together, and uh, we became Eskimo brothers. Uh, UrbanDictionary.com, you can look that up. Mike, are you good with that story? I mean, that sounds wonderful. All right, because we're the only two here. Yeah, yeah that does make it easy. When, it, when when we get the other folks, then uh, it might get a little more complicated. But then the the rest of it is uh, deciding what your your character's appearance is, uh, your rank, which is easy because everyone in this scenario is a private. Uh, within the squad, I think I'm gonna have red hair. Sounds sounds accurate. Yeah. Uh, a name and a nickname, which it sounds like you're already well on your on your way towards. And then, well, uh, can I reveal my nickname in, in the next show, please? Please do. Yeah, okay, let, let's let's keep it uh, suspenseful. Yeah, because I'm like thinking of like Seamus McDuster nuts, but I really got I I want to wordplay it. So. Um, Mike, you'll help me with this tomorrow. Look, you know. So, to, so to, to, at least to, to give some context, so your actual historical regimental commander is Howard Jumpy Johnson. So that's the to, to set the tone of what the, the kind of like the the casual parlance was at the time. You know, anything that that sounds like it would fit within uh, within you know nineteen forties wise guy talk is probably going to be just fine. Yeah, I got to think of. What they used to call the Irish back then, and nothing uh, good, but, I'm sure. Yeah, nothing good. So uh, I, I'm, uh, yeah. And then the so, final, the final step of this is to determine your gear. And of course, there's a, there are all sorts of things that you, know, if you were to, 
to wiggle your game master. You can try to ask them for different stuff. Uh, but essentially, there's a list uh, in the gear section on everything that was standard issued to a soldier on 101st, because that's the primary theme of the game. And so right. for this, everyone starts with that gear and whatever else you might have picked up in your background. I would like to get an M4A2. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> that, would, that, would be, that, would, that would be impressive if you had that in the drop zone, but no. Uh, let's be honest. Like Everybody else is shooting 7.7 .7 mil or 306, right? They'll laugh at an M4. Plus, you know, where do I get ammo? It's, it's way too difficult. Um, as an owner of a Garand, I'm probably going to take that. Um, but let's throw a little hook in here. As we know, and anybody that's seen Band of Brothers, uh, a lot of them lost equipment. So is it possible for the Game Master just to tell us what we found, what we have, when we, because we're going to start on the drop zone, right? Correct. Because I'm not jumping out of an airplane again. Nope. Well, we we start with the landing, and the of course there's they even mentioned the book that the leg bag was almost always lost, but uh, we can have some some equipment mishaps uh, to add a little drama there. I, I I'm 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 all for that. You see, that's what those guys get for not showing up. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, but now there there is one additional step here, and this is where the uh, again. You could tell the people at Firelock thought through this a bit when they were filling this out. Uh, as you saw, that there's a table there for background characters. And so, essentially, these are other folks that have names and ranks that are known to ever, all the player characters that are there in the story, but not under the control of the player. Uh, they're under control of the, the game master, and they're doing stuff you know, to, to make sure that it feels like you're in a unit and not just you know, three to five random people find their way through World War II, although those scenarios could also be interesting. Uh, but the, the, this, this, the secret sauce, the background character is you roll on the table to pick them up very quickly. Then you can see that they're, the, the table there for them, you can I quickly determine if they're a rifleman, scout, medic, weapon specialist, engineer, or leader. And then you roll on the appropriate table and it gives you what their stats are, what their skills are, what their specialization is right there off the table. Uh, and the, the the unstated piece about the background characters are they are not really your background character so much as they are the back up characters. So yeah. if you happen to you know eat an, you know, an 88 millimeter cannon around to the face on the drop zone, amazingly we have these characters ready to go in the background that can then step up. So you're not just sitting out the rest of the session watching your friends laugh and roll dice for three hours while you. Uh, role play a corpse, which I think is great, um, because I, you know, in our interview with Gabe, and I'm going to link this podcast to it. You know, I can see where guys really kind of fall in love with their characters, and you guys being RPG guys, like you guys play these characters for months, and then they die. But I guess it's fantasy; you can always bring them back to life, you know, with a necromancer or some shit like that. But the speed of character development kind of reminds me a lot of like Monster of the Week. So it's very quick, very quick, very easy to generate the characters. And there's an expectation based on the environment for which we're in that your life expectancy may be very short. Yeah, uh, so the ability thing, uh, to regenerate those characters very quickly is very helpful. Let's say if you're if you're in World War II, you only get to come back from the dead if you're Bob Dole or uh, Bob or uh, John Kennedy, right? So that's your unless you're playing one of those two guys. You know, if you if you're the dice fall. Then you're out of it. Again, you missed out, Mitch. You could have been a Kennedy. Yeah, I guess I could have. So, are we actually done with generating this? So I thought we'd it. be here so, for an hour and a half. No, so so the, I guess, and this is walking through painfully, like listening to me pedantically talk about different pieces of game design. You could sit down, uh, have them roll the, you know, a couple dozen rolls, fill in the sheet, and someone could be ready to play the scenario. So it. The life path does go very fast and let, and yet give you little story pieces that if your character survives the scenario and you want to carry them forward, you're not carrying forward a blank slate. You actually have someone who feels like they belong in the story. All right. So I'm going to now, since we're done with this, I, I'll give you my impressions and I got a million questions for you guys. And I, the, um, 
looking at this, this is easier than I thought it was going to be because the book is massive, but it's interesting. It's, it's a page turner. Um, this was a lot easier than I thought it was. So I'm going to thank you because I know you prepped for this. Um, but then again, you guys are RPG players. How does this stack up to other RPGs you guys have played? Is this easy development for characters here? Because I know when we did that one D and D one, it took forever. Oh, I think. Yeah, that, that, go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I think the degeneration is pretty quick, pretty easy, um, especially if you are going through the life path and just generating very quickly, because you don't have to stop and think about or think through where do I need to regenerate these at, or what do I need to distribute my points at, how do I need to distribute, is it three here, is it four there, uh, see and saw, and you know, min and maxing and things like you see in other RPGs. Here, here's what you're doing, and you're executing it at this step, and then you're done, you're moving on to the next thing. And at the end, you'll tally it all up onto the sheet. And if you happen to come by with multiple points inside another, a skill, great, good job. If not, that's okay, too. Um, so it, it does that. And then, again, just the randomness of, of having that. Um, you know, you don't, get to, you don't get to customize as much off of that life path, but because you're not customizing, you're not also sucking up a lot of time trying to build. What do you think, Nate? That I mean, this is a year zero game, uh, like the other stuff that you know that other companies have done. You know, it's all the year zero developed by the Free League, a Swedish gaming company. And what I really like about their systems is it's they tend to be pretty lean. You know, so rather than having a bunch of different attributes, there's four. You know, each attribute has four skills underneath it, so it's pretty easy. It's a dice pool system. It uses d6s, which any war gamer has a fistful of in their house somewhere. And so there's a lot of stuff that's just really ease of use there. Uh, and one of the things that I, again, I like about this is the, the system will force you to go wider versus deeper. And so if you have somebody who's like, just wants to play a certain mechanic, I just want to abuse this mechanic to try to, you know, be, have the world's greatest martial artist assassin in World War II, the, the system will fight you on that because it'll make you spread yourself out, out a bit more, which in this system actually makes you a much more useful character because uh, the way the Year Zero games work versus some other systems is it's, it's better to have a point in, in something than to be just trying to roll your straight attributes. And so having that random skill in your back pocket can be a lifesaver in certain situations. And also the characters tend to be fairly squishy and so because of that, you know, the, the, the other game that, that comes to mind that's also a Year Zero game is the Alien RPG based on the movies, where, of course, characters are supposed to die. And so whenever you have a game where you're expecting characters to die and not come back, it's good to be able to, to come up with something quickly to get someone back at the table so that way everyone is still having fun and being a part of the story and not feeling left out. Yeah, I... Um... I think this game, like a lot of when you guys are talking Year Zero and combining into other RPGs, I think that's going to resonate with folks that play RPGs. My thinking here is, you know, I see a lot of guys sitting around playing Flames of War, Bolt Action, World War II miniatures games. And I'm thinking I, War Stories would be something I think that they would dig. I really thought going into this was going to be so much harder. Because there's a lot of interesting stuff in this book. And i got to be honest, I've skimmed through the book a lot. I've read certain sections. Um, I kind of didn't know how to put it together. So would you guys recommend that somebody finds a Nate type with a bunch of me types, non-RPGers, not idiots, um, to kind of take them through the process like you did today, which seemed pretty easy. Um, and get them into playing a World War II RPG. Absolutely. Having, having that one first mover friend uh, with an RPG background, of course, helps to kind of make sense of all this, especially if they've played similar type games before. Uh, the other thing is that even though the game isn't designed strictly to play on a table with maps and miniatures, I think that because it does have rules that support that, it does create a nice bridging effect where, like as we will do in the demo, 
uh, obviously you won't be able to see, see it as you listen to the podcast, but having a map with tokens for the players and the non-player characters, being able to see relative distance and kind of like figure out what you want your tactics to be for the squad. It helps, I think, to transition folks who are think going from think about like, hey, here's what my squad would do, you know, from the the ten thousand foot view in the sky to the the trenches view of okay, what would my character do in the situation to help resolve this tactical dilemma? Or because of role playing yeah. game, it could be a a moral dilemma of hey, you know, we just came up with this, we found the perfect mortar firing point, uh, but we've got a you know, this will also put us in counterfire range, and our firing point is in this you know, this ruined French chateau with a, a, a woman and some orphans in there. So there's, there's you know, the, the thing of a role playing is, of course, that the game master's job is to twist the knife as much as possible. And, uh, you know, in the your typical tabletop war game, you know, you, you're going to throw the BS flag if somebody starts talking, asking you what you think about civilian casualties. But in this, which is, you know, in our war game parlance, a uh, semi-rigid open adjudication system with the game master as the referee it gives you space to play with some of those situations in a way that's probably going to be new to a lot of folks coming from the war game crowd. One thing I did notice, and I'll thank you for too, is this is definitely going to appeal to history buffs. Absolutely. Um, I I think that the game is just so deep. And, um, you know, I always... Kid around, like, you know, I, I, one day I got to start playing RPGs, and I, I really didn't with um, Twilight 2000. But this one just seems really interesting. And I've always had, and I think, Nate, you and I talked about it when, uh, of course, we went to a Caps game. Um, historical RPGs sometimes don't do very well, and I'm saying that more because there aren't a lot of them out there. Um, I, not too long ago, somebody asked me to check out this game called Ross Rifles because I like all things Canadian and Great War. And I just felt like, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 when I asked them why they did it, they were like, eh, we always kind of wanted to do it. So... However, I, you guys have never heard of the game, so right, it's not yeah. popular. They, they kind of did it for their group of friends, and they went on Kickstarter, and voila, you have it. Firelock really took a different tact with this, um, you know, with the, the owner of the company and Gabe being really long time. They've known each other for a really long time. RPG players, we really kind of want this. This is the thing we really want to have out there. Um, do you guys think from looking at this, How's this going to fare in the, I think for non-RPG players, I think it's going to fare well if you listen to this podcast. Do you think other RPG players are going to receive this game and it's going to be the new hotness? Well, so it's always tough to say because the, you know, when you compare the size of the RPG industry to the board game industry, you know, it's you know, an order of magnitude smaller. You know, so, you know the, the kind of the joke among a lot of, indie RPG developers is they're, they're passing the same, you know, crinkly $20 bill back and forth between each other as they buy each other's games. Uh, however, I do think that there is a, especially in light of some incidents going on in the, the RPG industry, the other you know, drama related to some things that's not germane to this, uh, but there's certainly a hunger out there for other types of games. And this has the, the advantage of being based off of something year zero that has robust publisher support uh, is a known system is a dice pool system that's very easy to use people figure it out and pick it up quickly and so i think being able to to tell stories that aren't fantasy uh, to tell stories that are based more in the real world i think there's definitely an appetite for that uh, and i know that there's been a couple of games out there uh, not with year zero but well historical games using a powered by the apocalypse system like night witches which is about the f a soviet female pilots in world war ii oh yeah were very, were very well received uh by the community so i think that, you know I, I, my predictive power or my my track record for predictions isn't great but i certainly think that uh because of its pedigree and because of the system and the niche that it's in i think that war stories 
definitely has a fighting chance to make a splash. So as you guys as soldiers, like real world soldiers, um, you know, I, I hear this all the time and I spar with people. Matter of fact, I'm doing a podcast with a guy that does just PC games. And he was he listened. He had an article about this game. These games are realistic. And I kind of laughed at him. Um, but both you guys are big on history. Both you guys kind of understand a little bit how the army works, which you don't need for this game. Um, sometimes when I look at things like, uh, you know, somebody talking about how air power is used, it's, it insults my intelligence. What did you guys think going through the rules as far as, you, you know, did they get everything right? You know, when you watch a war movie and the guy's wearing like, you know, a, a wrong part of the uniform, it bothers me. How do you guys think they did here? I think this is familiar enough that it will play well, right? It, it's familiar enough that uh, it's understanding and we can play into, oh, this is kind of what they meant or this is how we relate it back to that. Even if you don't have an in-depth knowledge on history, you know, just say it's maybe it's just Band of Brothers, right? We'll talk about uh, the current generation. Maybe it's only Band of Brothers that they've seen or some other World War One, World War Two movie it's at least close enough that they can understand some of this. And if you're just talking about, you know, the general soldier, the lingo is close enough and the um, it's familiar enough that I think that it, they would be able to play through it and play it with understanding. I certainly Nate? agree. I think that uh, it's actually the, the guy who developed the cyberpunk RPG, which is also awesome. Uh, Mike Pondsmith. Uh, he was famous for coming up with this this rule set called the Friday Night Firefight. Uh, that talking about you know, how the, the how they wanted gunplay to work in the game, and and Mike's stance was like I I'm not here to give you a a realistic set on bullet ricochets and penetration and all that. I want to give you something that that allows you to to feel like you're in a firefight, and I think that this does that this war story system also does that well in that, you know, could I, as a, as a guy with an armor background, quibble about how they've rated certain vehicles and what, you know, the, the difference in the cannons and how they've given tags and stuff like, oh, sure, like I could, you know, I could just needle that all day long. But it gets very right, like, hey, if, if a grenade lands in your trench, you're going to freak out because a grenade can kill you. You know, getting into a firefight is always dangerous. You know, any any bullet out there in the battlefield could kill you. Like, or you could just get a little, you know, get dinged and end up with you know, the you know the million dollar wound and be touring with the president uh, as per the random table. So there's there's a lot in the game that I think uh, does very well at putting players on edge because they know their character is in danger in this moment uh, without getting bogged down in the minutia of like, oh well, what was the angle and the velocity of this particular round, which I think is a a great design space to be in for this kind of game. So like you guys probably have RPG groups you play with all the time. I know some of the guys that are going to be playing when we actually play the game, do it. Is this something that you may start an RPG group and play in the next couple of months? So I think that certainly it's a, uh, I would, would want to, uh, I already talked to some other army folks, military adjacent people uh, that I play with about trying to, to at least give them a demo to show them what the game is all about. Uh, there's also a, a website for people to host uh, paid RPG games. So, hey, I will, I will be your, your mercenary game master, run the game for you. And, uh, and I, I there show that, hey, the splash, hey, this is a, something that's going to be demoed in the future on this podcast is this game to see if there's people out there that want to play. So. And certainly it's something that I'm, I am, am very excited about talking about and seeing that it actually roll out. And I know that there's at least a, 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 probably a half dozen folks that I've talked to back and forth who also want to give it a spin after the podcast. Currently, yeah. my huge community, Mitch, revolves around a 10-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 16-year-old. Um, so personally, probably not with it. Um, I thought... I thought it would be you're... interesting to pull that in. I've uh, I have a lot of friends, but currently not a lot of continuous active play, unfortunately. I thought the conditions of your parole said you can't talk to people those ages. <laughs> <laughs> we 
Well, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe for that character. Yeah, so, but so the um, one thing I would say though, Mitch, is the uh, if, if you get a chance to talk to Firelock, the the one thing that the game does desperately need uh, is a a integrated character sheet for virtual tabletop. So there's a couple of the big ones out there. Uh, Roll20 is the biggest, oldest one. Uh, Foundry is also Foundry a very big community. Uh, uh, Fantasy Grounds. Yeah. They all have places where you can you, you set up the game online and you can just have the, the, the character sheet integrated into the tabletop to pull up and roll with your friends. Uh, you can obviously well, do that without that, just like hand jamming it with uh, the sheet. But if Firelock had those options out there for online play, which is what a lot of people do now post-pandemic, I, th I think that would definitely help the community. I am uh, even not limited to online play because I know here here at the house when I play, I end up using a VTT or a virtual tabletop, excuse me, for uh, for our play, even though we're all sitting around the kitchen table. So, uh, I, you know, I'll bring it up to them in a way you just told them because um, every once in a while they listen to the podcast we do for them. But uh, are you are you also volunteering to do it? For a free copy of the game? I'll say that I, I would gladly uh, do that, except my knowledge of actual programming is about limited to looking up macros for VTTs on YouTube and then copy pasting them into my own game. So I, I would be the wrong guy to ask. All right. So we got to go troll in the high schools to get a kid that knows how to program. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, overall, I was a little apprehensive about this. I'm impressed. Um, I, I'm definitely going to play this. Mike, we're going to have to get a couple of other people and start a group for this. That's what we're going to do. Um, well, you know, we'll get JR. He's going to be the, he should be the, uh, the NCO with the, you know, He'll the, be the, army the man in the group. Yeah. 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 But, um, hey, what's fucking good about it? Yeah. But <laughs> I'm excited. And we're, you know, we're hitting a little over an hour, which is about most of our folks can't, uh, can't pay attention more than that. So I, we're going to sign off, send it back to Sean in the studio. I want to thank you guys very much for doing this and for coming back at a later date. Nate, I really want to thank you because you really did your homework on this where I thought we'd be doing this for two and a half hours. And then I'd say, hey, well, we'll, we'll talk to you some other time and how the characters turn out. So uh, if you guys want to say bye for now and we'll send it back to Sean in this Actually, you guys say goodbye, and then Nate, send it back to Sean in the studio. Uh, thanks, Mitch. Uh, super great to be on the show. Looking forward to the next session. I think it was wonderful to be here, and we'll see you around. Thanks so much for joining the show tonight. Remember to follow us on Twitter at No Dice, No Glory. And keep the conversation going on NoDiceNoGlory.com, now featuring our own message boards. Have a great night, everybody.